Dr. Almut Gada was dismissed from the Open University for questioning a DEI diktat that criminal law tutors must liberate the curriculum by introducing diverse gender identities and teaching students to use offenders' preferred pronouns. Managers have claimed she'd created an environment which, quote, isn't inclusive, trans-friendly or respectful. Well, I'm now joined by Dr. Almut Gada. Welcome to the show. So I've given there just a brief summary, but perhaps you could tell us more about the background to this. You're a law lecturer, right? I am a law lecturer, yes. So I taught various law modules in the Open University's law school. And th then around the start of the de uh, decade, a lot more of the critical social justice theories were just generally coming into the teaching. And the undergraduate law curriculum was then rewritten completely around a core theme of liberating the curriculum, which be basically means that whichever kind of law you te teach, you have to use it as a vehicle to, uh, uh, to convey critical social justice theories li uh, like and anti-racism and decoloniality. Uh, yeah, because we've seen similar things in English literature, decolonizing the curriculum, that kind of thing. But when it comes to something like law, uh, is that not the case that, that really there isn't room there to be pushing an ideology? It should be about what is the law? Oh, it absolutely should be. And it was more more trying to crowbar it in somewhere where just to find a way of fitting in references to the, these critical social justice themes somewhere. And I actually challenged that on various modules. So, so, so at some point I questioned the decoloniality on one module and at another point I questioned the, the anti-racism on another module, which seemed to be acceptable. But when I then questioned why I had to teach gender identity belief as part of <coughs> teaching criminal law, that apparently was beyond the pale. And uh, when I, I asked questions about the teaching of genderism as part of criminal law, the response that I got from university management was just, we're not going to discuss it. You will teach this to your students. The subject is closed. And then they waited to the end of the academic year and then took disciplinary action and sacked me for the gross misconduct of questioning the teaching of gender identity belief as part of criminal law module. Did they not accept that the belief that we have a gender identity is in fact a highly contested belief that actually is shared by a small minority of the population? Well, that was actually one of the first points I made. It wasn't that I went out wanting to teach any particular views or, or share with my colleagues any particular view, uh, views on gender. What I started out saying really was, can we not include this in the teaching of criminal law because it's just a distraction? My students have enough on their plate understanding the criminal law, understanding the offences I'm telling them about, understanding how to tackle a legal problem and so forth. I don't then have to be sidetracked by talking about the fact that there are over 100 gender identities out there. Can I just focus on teaching criminal law in my criminal law tutorials? I mean, it seems quite reasonable, <laughs> to be honest. Yes, but apparently the answer to that was no. Or more specifically, the answer that I got at the time was that I had to included in order to help achieve broader objectives of liberating the curriculum. Liberating the curriculum. Yes. I mean, that's an astonishing phrase. And the thing about this is it's not just a matter of them saying, you can't say this, you can't say that, not like a free speech issue. They're actually trying to compel you to say things, to express beliefs you don't hold for whatever reason. Is that, have I read that right? Oh, absolutely, yes. Actually, the Faculty of Business and Law is kind of different from the other faculties in the Open University in that it is so liberated that they tell us what to say in every single tutorial. Wow. The, well, yes, the, the other faculties wouldn't dream of it, but because the curriculum is so liberated now, now or I'm not sure why, they control very closely what any tutor says in every <coughs> single one of, uh, of the tutorials of every single module. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, yes, in, in that sense, I, I, I said, well, my students might not believe in it, tutors right. might, uh, might not believe in it. So, uh, so in addition to it being a distraction, I think it might be illegal, because you're asking tutors and students to practice a belief that they, uh, they might not uh, hold. And again, this came back to the point that there are broader ideological objectives to achieve, liberating the curriculum and so forth. And then I apparently completely set off of a manager when I replied to, uh, to, to that, that the idea of teaching something that isn't actually relevant to your top, uh, topic, to the subject that you teach, in order to achieve ideological objectives is something that might be particularly familiar to those among us who hail from totalitarian regimes. Uh, that's absolutely <laughs> right. And of course, it's not ethical for a teacher to behave in that way. 
it's, it's not. No, no, you are abusing your position in the classroom, essentially. You are uh, abusing your pos uh, position to use your students as a captive audience yes. uh, who will listen to your political speech. Uh, and that is not what university should ever be about. You can cover, of course, in a university course, you can cover uh, controversial issues. But if you're covering a controversial issue, it's your role, really, your responsibility as a tutor to introduce your students to the full range of ideas that are out there on the subject that you're teaching. Yes. And then to equip your students with the critical thinking skills to, to grapple with all those different ideas and to develop their own thoughts on, uh, on it, to learn how to articulate their own thoughts on it. That's what, what you know, universities have traditionally but, done when they've ta taught controversial theories, not pick one side in a political debate right. and then teach that as the right one. So the Open University's defence is that they say, well, you know, it's not trans-inclusive unless you are saying that you personally also believe in this and everyone else must believe in it. What do you make of that criticism? Uh, well, I mean, that particular dismissal ground just seemed particularly ridiculous. I mean, I mean, what this comes back to is the fact that, well, they gave four dismissal grounds, essentially all for the same actions, as in questioning the teaching of genderism as part of the criminal law module. And one of them was that I had violated the transgender staff policy. Now, the transgender staff policy is a policy that deals with how the university responds if a member of staff comes out, out as trans, which is fair enough to have a policy like that. Now, of course, that wasn't my situation because I wasn't in a situation where any member of staff or any student or anybody at all had come out as trans. But there's a sort of preamble at the start of the transgender staff policy, which says something along the lines of the Open University is committed to being a, an inclusive and trans-friendly and respectful space. Right. And from that, they then draw the silly conclusion uh, that apparently in questioning the teaching of genderism as part of criminal law, I had created an environment that wasn't trans-friendly and I had therefore violent, uh, violated the trans staff policy and that was a sacking offence. Now, a lot of people will be shocked to hear this, particularly because, you know, I've had Joe Phoenix on this show before who faced similar problems at the OU, set up a gender critical research network, was harassed and bullied to the point where she ended up being diagnosed with PTSD uh, for holding those l legal beliefs. These are, these are beliefs that are protected in law. Why don't people who are involved in the teaching of law know the law? <laughs> yes, I think that's a very good question, yes, at least. I mean, Joe Phoenix was in social sciences, and you might forgive social scientists for not sure. understanding the law. But, uh, but I think you're quite, quite right, because I spent a number of months trying to explain to my colleagues and to my managers why what we were being asked to do was illegal, in my view. And yes, I think you're quite, quite right. You'd think that any senior law academic worth their salt should be able to identify if I or recognise a violation in of equality law when it is pointed out to them yes. should be able to uh, recognize a violation of human rights law when it is spelled out to them yes so i think there are two possible conclusions here either uh, they're not very good at understanding the law or they don't have any intention of respecting the law and of course you mentioned the way it is in totalitarian regimes you know it's it's funny that everyone who's come from countries which have that kind of background they don't take this stuff for granted. And they're, they're quite surprised when they see people in this country trying to impose ideology at, uh, you know, at the cost of being sacked. I think you're probably more attuned to that kind of thing if you've grown up with totalitarianism, which well, I personally haven't. I haven't grown up in a totalitarian regime, but, a re regime, but I have grown up with the family memory of it. I've even grown up with these sort of East German books on the bookshelf where you had this experience of look up any subject in the encyclopedia and it's, it's sort of related back then to Marxist ideology and any term you look up ultimately uh, ends with an explanation of how this particular con uh, concept confirms that Marx was right. Wow. So, uh, well, those are books <laughs> that have been passed down to you from family members? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I was 10 years old when the Berlin Wall ca came down. My parents had East German books as well as West German books on their bookshelf. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so it was quite natural for, uh, for, for, me, uh, for me growing up to sort of read East German books and compare them to West German books. Uh, yes. In that sense, I just developed a particular sensitivity, I suppose, to this habit of just using any subject as uh, and, uh, and turning it into a vehicle to convey the dominant political ideology. So you've seen all this before? I have absolutely seen all, all wow. this before. I've had family members for several generations being punished for not going along with teaching the ideology du jour. I wasn't going to be the first generation in my family sort of further circa by just blindly going along with it.
Absolutely not. Um, well, uh, I'm really pleased that you've come and told this story because I think a lot of people will be shocked by it. Can people help in any way? I think you've got a crowdfunder at the moment. I do have a crowdfunder, so if people have Googled my na na name and Crowdjustice, Almut Gado and Crowdjustice, or if you follow the Free Speech Union uh, on Twitter, they have been regularly tweeting about my, my case, so that will take you to my crowdfunder. So the Free Speech Union are helping you at the moment with all of this? Uh, they beca absolutely are. are because yes. you've been, they, they sacked you, right? They sacked yes, they, they have sacked me, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully well, we're cry trying to create a precedent and a test case that... Uh, that uh, uh, t tests uh, some of the points about the protections in employment law for academic freedom. So yes. it is, as far as the Free Speech Union co uh, uh, are concerned, also an important case more widely and beyond just me w uh, uh, me winning a just outcome. It will hopefully create a precedent for protecting academic freedom in employment law. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Almagano, thanks so much for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.